This is CX of M Radio, the voice of customer experience professionals. Hello, and welcome to another World of UX podcast. This is your host, Darren Hood. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to join us on today. As always, a special welcome to those of you joining us for the first time. Special welcome for you. We're proceeding in our Sinister series, as we call it for short, where we've been talking about sinister traits that are at work today in UX. And we're going to start on number 64 today, and there's some subsets along with each one. So if you really numbered these, they've got to get somewhere upwards to 200 or so at minimum because for each one of these there's several bullet points that i've been addressing and those are different items but as far as the main items that we're discussing we're going to get into number 64 tonight and number 64 is a little different and this one was inserted after some some experiences some encounters some discussions some observations and, and so this is a another special segment that we're inserting into the series, and I'm referring to this as the asides and rant <laughs> episode. So these are asides. Some of these are slightly related to some of the things that we've been talking about already. Then there are some other things that are here that is just me ranting, just in all transparency, just ranting about some things. It's a really frustrating time for many. So I'm I'm really expressing not only my own thoughts and feelings here today, and and, and it's really critical that people understand that. It's funny how people, they want to make what I'm saying all related to me. Yeah, I'm the person talking. Yeah, I'm the person doing the show. But these are not my sentiments alone that are being shared. And I'm going to start off with one that's not in this list today. And there was a conversation that someone I respect dearly actually made a comment and they were talking about how really trying to caution up and coming UXers about when they hear different people say something. And they were talking about the segment that we were in, the little meeting we were in. And and there were three or four of us that you consider to be real seniors. Everybody who says they're a senior isn't today. That's one of the big problems today in UX, everything is just flat out upside down, as we mentioned recently. And they said, you, you know, they, we're all, we all have different viewpoints and things to say, but know that we're just three or we're just four people, and, and, and there's no way that we reflect everybody that's out there. That's a dangerous statement. Let me explain why. There's something that people don't consider, and it's called waiting. And when I say waiting, This is something that should be very familiar to those of you who focus a lot on research. And when I say waiting, it's not W-A-I-T, it's W-E-I-G-H-T-I-N-G. When you hear somebody say something, what they say should have a certain amount of weight that you ascribe to it based on their level of expertise, their level of exposure. How much does that person really know? How much authority is really associated with what they say. I mean, you have people who say stuff all the time. We're going to share some of those today in this episode. But people may say something, but if they don't have any experience and they make a statement, that's just words. That's just words. What somebody knows, what they've been exposed to, how much experience they have or have means something. And it needs to be Take it into consideration when you hear what they're saying. I mean, think about it from a UX research standpoint. Whose words carry more weight? A person who's using your product or a person who has zero familiarity? They'll both have some degree of weight. But the person who's, depending upon the questions you're asking or the tasks that are being performed, the different answers will have different weights based on what that particular user or research participant brings to the table. So when the person made a statement and they said, well, we're only three or we're only four people, can't remember what it was, doesn't really matter. The the message stays the same. How much weight is associated with each person's statement? Now, and I'm going to speak on my behalf. 
when I say something, it's not just me. It's never just me. And and that's why I talk about things like personal heuristic repository, where each individual knows a certain amount when it comes to heuristics, a certain every person knows X number of heuristics and the number of heuristics that a person knows is going to vary from person to person. Hence, when a person does a heuristic analysis, the depth that's going to be offered through their analysis is going to vary based on that prior heuristic exposure and knowledge. The same thing is happening if there's a group of us and we're sitting around talking, there's 10 of us talking, and three people have, have goodness, 90 years of experience between them and another person comes and says something and they have one year of experience. You have to ascribe the weight. It doesn't take the validity of the statement necessarily away from the person who has less experience, but it depends on what that person is saying. <laughs> if that person is trying to speak Beyond their experience level, you can't ascribe any weight to that. If the person is telling you what happens on a daily basis at their job, you can ascribe a lot of weight to that statement. And then you're going to look for statements from, from other people who are in other situations and you want to put all that together. And then you, you analyze and you synthesize that data. But when a person set, makes a statement and the statement is not reflective of their acumen, their authority, their expertise, you cannot ascribe weight to it. And at the same time, if there's a lot of experience, you have to ascribe more weight to it. So again, back to me as an example, I talk to people all over the world. I make it my business to find out what's going on at different companies. I make it my business to find out what's going on in different circles from a hiring perspective, from how are things being handled at different places of employment, different companies. What, what are some of the variables or some of the variations in the way that different teams operate, different UX teams from organization to organization to organization? I go out and gather this information. Do I document it? No. Frankly, that's stupid. I don't need to document it. There are some of us that have good recall, and there are some of us that are honest. I have both. I have good recall, and I'm honest, so I'm not going to fabricate anything. I'm not going to try to spin something so that I can make a particular point, I'm going to tell you what I've found, what I've seen, what I've heard. I'm going to analyze. I'm going to synthesize the data that I gather. So when I talk to you, just like what we do with UX research, you have five participants, 10 participants, 50, 100 participants, 200 participants, whatever it is, there's a number associated with the information that I share. And so when people blow it off, thinking that I'm speaking from a personal perspective only, that's extremely erroneous. In some cases, it, it's more than that. In some cases, it's discriminatory for several different reasons that I'm not going to get into in this episode. But please know and understand, when you hear somebody, try to understand who that person is so you can ascribe weight to what they say. And I'll, I'll speak to that again as we get into several of these asides and some of these rants that I want to share with you. So let, let, let's dive in. The first aside and rant has to do with, uh, and this is a rant, more of a rant, but it's still an aside. I have helped a lot of people in, in UX get jobs. I've helped them in places where I worked. I helped them get jobs in other places. I share job postings all the time. I've recommended and referred people to get jobs. But it's quite interesting that it's, it's, there's, I can only think of one person in all the years that I've helped people come to get a job where I worked. This is going to be very uh, exposing, but you know, it is what it is. I don't know about the places where I help people get jobs and they didn't work with me. The ones where they did work with me, I can only think of one person I helped get hired that did not try to destroy me. Only one. And, and it's really sad. There's a possibility of two, but generally speaking, I can only think of one. And I mean, where they didn't do it, where they didn't do a single solitary thing to detrimentally impact me. I mean, of all the people that I've helped, all of them, <laughs> except for one, maybe two, give it two. There's always room for error, right? The error ratio, but no, this, this is pretty accurate. There's definitely no more than two that didn't 
There's definitely one, possibly two. A lot of people that I helped get hired, they later tried to destroy me. A lot of people that I that I helped to get hired, uh, they got hired and they they eventually tried to take credit for something that I did. I helped people get hired, and they partnered with other people who were haters to and, and worked together to try to orchestrate my demise. We're not making this stuff up, folks. This is not drama. This is stuff I had to live with on a daily basis <laughs> over the course of my career. There are people who got hired and worked to undermine me. There are people who got hired, but then when the opportunity came to help me get hired, when they went somewhere else, I literally had a person that I helped get a job once when they were in a position and their company was hiring. And I let them know that I had just applied for a job, hoping they'd put in a word, things of that nature. And and, and I actually did that in that particular case, knowing that this person had done something dirty to me in the past but it's still worth mentioning. I, I didn't really think they were going to help me or put in a word for me. It didn't mean I wasn't going to ask. And, and the person literally said, well, good luck in your job search, which basically say, get lost. We, I don't care. When that person was down on their lock, luck and wanted somebody to give them a chance, some of you seen my, my takes on the whole give somebody a chance thing. It's, it's quite interesting how many of the people that you give a chance, when they get the chance, don't give People who gave them a chance or people like the people that gave them a chance, they don't give us a chance. It's interesting. That's quite ironic that things work that way. But so for that reason, I'm not big on recommending it anymore. I really, it's not that I'll never do it again, I, but I, I can't do it without uh, <laughs> without having that, that one concern way in the back of my mind. That If I ever recommend somebody for a job where I'm working again, uh, they're going to have to have the utmost integrity in order for me to to be comfortable in, in doing that um, be, just because of what I have experienced in the past. Uh, take this for how you will, but that's I'm just being very transparent about it today. And again, it's a rant. I'm ranting. This is safe space for me, so I'm going to rant. Number two <laughs> on the list for today, the isms, misdirection. This isn't more of an observation. Again, it's an aside, and it's a bit of a rant as well. But the isms and the misdirection associated with the the isms really abounds. And and this is a – I've got to preface this statement. I support everybody. I don't care who you are. To me, it's all about doing the work. So whenever anybody comes to the plate, I really don't care what your demographics are. It's all about doing the work. So I'm not looking at any of that. I'm not looking at the color of your skin. I'm not looking at how old you are. I'm not looking at your gender. I'm not looking at anything. I Can you do the work? Can you bring value? That's it. And everything begins and stops there with Darren Hood. That's how I look at things. And I notice, though, that there are times that people would have an event or they have some type of an initiative. And for some reason, it ended up that everybody was, uh, there was all, they were all men. This is where I always see it. They say, oh, you know, and then somebody will come, a woman will come along and will complain and will say, well, you know, how come they don't have any women in there? And they complain because there's no women. And they sometimes they go in and make issues out of it. And, and I understand what they're getting at in general. But there's a lot of instances where there are no women or there, there are no black people or there are, not, there are no minorities or there's no something. And and that was not the intention at all. There's instances where there's all women, there's no men, and nobody meant to do that. That's just that's just the way that, that things played out. Nobody is trying to shut people out in a lot of these instances. A lot of these instances, and that's my observation. That's what I'm going to get at. These people, sometimes, they appear to be raging about the supposed oversight. And here's where the problem comes into play. You see, remember I just said most. You'll see some of these same people who complain. And the, the last example that I saw, they complained because there was no women. These guys, five guys got together and done something, and they were complaining because there was no women. They complained because there was no women and then turn around and do the same exact thing. They, they go out and do something, and there's no men. If you're all for equality, then demonstrate equality. Don't don't cry. Don't don't complain. Don't try to 
assassinate somebody else's character and then turn around and do the same thing. And, and this is one of the other sinister traits. I mentioned it earlier. Hypocrisy in, in UX is off the charts. And a lot of times it shows up in the form of the isms. And when I mention the isms, I'm talking about racism, sexism, ageism, cronyism, you name it, all the isms. And, and, and so again, sometimes people are doing something. There's no intention. Whoever put that together, that might not be the case, but I know that there's people in the one that I observed, there's people who were in that group and I've heard them complain that there's no women. And then here they are and there's five women or or 10 women doing something. And when you have that many, a lot of times somebody worked hard to make sure that it was structured that way. And so don't complain and then turn around and do the same thing you complain about. That hypocrisy is bad for the discipline. Uh, but it's running rampant today. This ism misdirection. You, somebody is guilty, but when you do it, you're not. We got to be better than that. So I hope some people will take that for what it is. Don't read anything into it. Uh, don't 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 come and twist my words. It's it it's ism misdirection. And yes, it hurts the discipline. It, we if we're, if we're gonna have everybody be a part, then have everybody be a part. But but don't comp- cry about something and then do the same thing because then now your the the complaint is null and void now, it's null and void. Matter of fact, just go and do what you do. If you set something up and it just so happens that everybody on the panel is a female, fine. If if you set something up and everybody on the panel is a male, fine. But but just be aware, be sensitive. Be open to, don't be so rigid that you're only accepting people in certain circles because then you're really tying into the isms and, and that's where the problems that we have really addressed that separately and completely be aware of that and don't be a hypocrite today. It's really crazy. Observation uh, rant aside, number three, I recently heard somebody say, and this was hilarious, if you're in UX you know the buzzword of accessibility. And I was thinking, I, re- I replied to this, and I told the person, accessibility is not a buzzword. So this is one of those situations where you have somebody, they're trying to put themselves out there, they're trying to be heard, because people say, put yourself out there, so people do. They put themselves out there, they don't bother to get any any authority behind what they say, they don't bother to get accurate about what they say. They just worry about getting themselves out there. That needs to stop. It, it There has to be quality. If somebody's going to offer something up, it has to offer quality to the partakers, not just out there to be out there. How can somebody say accessibility is a buzzword? That is grossly, a, a grossly misinformed perspective. Accessibility is so critical. Companies are being sued because they don't invest any time and effort into making their resources accessible. So that's not a buzzword. That's that's millions of dollars, billions of dollars beyond buzzwords. So let's look at things the right way. And, and because UX is all about trustworthiness, building trust, building reputations among stakeholders, we have to be in the business of saying things that are legit. We have to be in the business of saying things that people can bank on and not making flippant statements. Because if you're on social media making flippant statements, what are you doing when you're talking to your stakeholders? And and we address this too. There's a lot of people in the fake it till you make it crowd. There's no room for the fake it till you make it component. But it takes more work to fake something than it does to get it right. Why not just get it right? Why not just do the right thing? Why not just tell the truth? So this is what we need to do. Stop putting yourselves out there for the sake of putting yourself out there. When you have something of value to share, it's going to be blatantly obvious that you want to share it. And if you could naturally care for people, then you will automatically share something that's going to benefit other people. Selfish people say things just to put the attention on themselves. And this that that UX celebritism that we're being struck by, that we're being overrun by, that stuff needs to stop. That's where all these things are, are tied together. Folks, accessibility is not a buzzword. It's a real deal to the extent that there are principles that are established to help govern how organizations approach accessibility. So let's, let's get it right. Let's let, it's not a buzzword. Let, let's straighten that out today. Next one. I saw a post where someone said, where they were celebrating the fact that they had achieved 
Super mentor status, and I'll just say it this time with ADP list. Number one, who cares? <laughs> Frankly, <laughs> uh, a super mentor status, that's that that's and people are trying to achieve that. And, and so we set up this weird goal for people to try to achieve that does nothing for the people who partake. But that's not my main point in this particular rant and observation. The person said that they had had achieved super mentor status. The problem with it, beyond what I just said, the problem is that they had only been mentoring for a month. If there is such a thing as super mentor status, how in the world could a person achieve it in a month? And when you look at these people who have these types of celebratory types of posts, on social media, some of them don't have very much experience. Some of them don't even qualify to be mentors. Frankly, so by 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 the company's own standards, some of these people don't qualify. So, but they approve them anyway while rejecting other people who do qualify. Go if you can figure that out, let me know because it's 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 really weird and it's 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 damaging to the discipline. It builds up the reputation of the people behind it, but it's it's damaging to the discipline. Anybody out there under the sound of my voice, if you're not doing things to help the discipline, then you're basically the enemy of the discipline. You are a stumbling block to the discipline. You're a pitfall for the discipline. And it is up to each individual to make sure we're not a pitfall. We're not a stumbling block. We're we're not something to be overcome in order to succeed. But when people are out there bragging about achieving a status that shouldn't exist and then doing it in in a period of time, or over a period of time that should not be attainable. Uh, that actually speaks to the ethics. I, I've gone off about the mentoring. I did an uh, episode where I talked about mentoring in particular, demystifying it and trying to get rid of some of the Kool-Aid factors and the predatory elements associated with mentoring. Yes, some mentoring is predatory. Um, let's get over that. Do, who, you're a super mentor. Who cares? Are you a super UXer? Be that. Be, be a super UXer. Bring value to your team. Bring value to your organization. Bring value to your to to, to the people that are right there in front of you. And, and if if more people would start providing or be in a position to, and then provide mentor services at work, there wouldn't be much need for all this outside the company mentoring. Frankly, a lot of it wouldn't be needed. Now, we're going to build relationships, and it's going to happen. But the the volume at which it's happening makes no sense. So. Just to say, and people don't have to like what I'm saying, but it's going to come back and bite you if you don't. Next, I want to talk about the issue of somebody that I saw recently who (laughs) they claim to speak on behalf of the entire design community. You already know something's wrong when you hear that. And this person who, when I checked, they had not been doing UX for longer than a few years. Uh, unless a person has been doing UX for at least 25 to 30 years, they shouldn't even dream of making a statement like that. It doesn't matter what's happen- what's going to come behind that, especially when the circles that that person operates in are very, very small. So you have a little bit of experience, a very small circle, and but then turn around and make a statement on behalf of the entire design community apologizing to all junior and product product and UX designers. The the post was full of misinformation. It was pull, full of toxic positivity. It was full of coddling. It was full of statements that made absolutely no sense. And all it did was, and I see a lot of people doing this, they make statements like that to rally people to themselves. They make statements like that to get a following, to, to build a following. I made a comment. I replied. I said, this is full of misinformation. It's full of toxic positivity. It's not accurate. And you're not speaking for me. So don't go around apologizing. I haven't done anything to apologize for. So I don't have anything to apologize for because I haven't done anything to you. So I'm not, and I'm not going to. I'm going to work to make sure that I don't have anything to apologize for. I'm going to make sure that my conscience is that clear. How about that for a level of, of, of integrity? A lot of people can't even relate to that, but... It's, it's there. So for a person like this to speak on behalf of the entire design community, folks, in all honesty, it's an absolute joke and it's not even possible. So let's keep that in mind. And it's sad. And a bunch of people 
We're coming in there. Oh, I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. No, the person said nothing of value. The person said absolutely nothing of value, and people are thanking them for it. So we need to be more selective. We need to be more astute. We need to to be more committed to critical thinking. And when you do that, you'll be in a safer position, and you'll benefit yourself, your teams, and the discipline at large. Next rant and observation. It has to do with what I call the sellouts. I I heard a person once presenting misinformation to a group of up and coming UXers and making statements with full confidence. They were just apologizing for stuff. The, the person in this particular case literally said, if somebody tells you that they know how to apply more than two or three different UX research methodologies, that person is a liar. And then they went on to make other ridiculous, inaccurate statements. I know a bunch of people that know more than two or three different UX methodologies. That's, that's, that's ridiculous to say such a thing. And this again, this person has been doing UX for really not that long. When you really go back and look at the profile, of course, I'm not going to tell you who said it. I know who said it. I'm not going to say who said it. But I know that the person, if they had truly been growing in a healthy manner, they wouldn't be sharing misinformation. That's something people need to start catching. If somebody spews misinformation, there's a problem. Will we all say the same exact thing? No. Do we all have to say the same exact thing? No. There are different perspectives. There are also different ways of expressing the same thing. So I love how I love Dr. Ari's take. Go and check out what Dr. Ari has to say about UX research. Dr. Ari talks about three or four different approaches that you can take in UX research. And if you can master those four, he talks about what grade of a position you're going to be in to drive value with UX research. I agree with him. I don't teach the same thing, not exact in the same exact words, but I agree with him because I can take those same four things and I can break them down into granular applications. And those same four, by the time we're done, I've talked about like 15 or 16 different things because there are variants within those three or four. So it's fine. I don't have a problem with that. And I think that it's fine for him to say that and fine to go teach it. But I know when I go to teach it, I'm going to break these other things down and I'll talk about card sorting. I'll talk about um, tree testing. I'll talk about interviewing. I'll talk about uh, cognitive walkthroughs. I'll talk about heuristic analysis. That's a part of research. I'll talk about um, ethnography. Uh, I'll talk about, man, I mean, there's A-B testing. I mean, we can go on and on and on. That's seven. We can go on and on and on calling out different aspects of UX research methods, methodologies, techniques that we use now. But when you go from organization to organization, the ones that you use will shift but you'll still fall within those same four umbrellas, if you will, that, that Dr. Ari was talking about. So I just said that to give the illustration. But you won't hear Dr. Ari give any misinformation. You won't hear me give any misinformation. There's a lot of other people. You can go right down the list. You won't hear people giving out misinformation. This person said, you're not going to know more than one or two. And he wasn't saying it from the perspective that Dr. Ari was saying it from. He was saying it literally a couple of different methods, methodologies, and techniques. Then he proceeded to make another statement that was grossly inaccurate. And so I had a relationship with the person. So I reached out to him and I told him about what he said. And I asked him, why did you say that? This is not true. Somebody's going to hear you say that. Then they're going to hear me say something. Then they're going to get confused. And, and then that's going to create all of these problems. Why are you telling them that it's not accurate? Oh, you know, I just got to say, you know, and people want to hear. And they just kept making excuses for what they said. And then to make matters, and they never went back and apologized, by the way, before I go forward. They never apologized. And, and, And then to make matters worse, the same person comes back to me later and wants me to speak at one of their UX events as if that conversation never took place. This is that's that's what I call a sellout. This is a person that is trying to build a resource, trying to build a name for themselves in the community through the guise of like gaslighting and manipulating people in the process. 
And so they're they're all about making a name for themselves and all about making money. It's not about the purity of the discipline. That makes that person dangerous. That makes everybody that listens to that person dangerous until they realize they need to they need to back off, at least from the perspective to know when that person is is actually sharing misinformation. And I was talking to somebody recently about this same thing. And the person said, and I've heard this metaphor for years. Well, you know, sometimes you got to eat the meat and throw away the bones. And, and I replied to the person, I said, we got to respect people enough to serve in filet. There shouldn't have to be any bone removal. You should be able to listen to somebody without having to take on the task of filtering through what they're talking about or discovering three years later that what they said was ridiculous and completely inaccurate. We need to respect people enough to tell them what's right up front. So let, let's keep that in mind and beware of the sellouts. Rant, observation aside for the day, number seven, corrupt hiring practices. Uh, I, I interacted with somebody recently and there was something that they had posted and I noticed something erroneous about it. So I let them know and they went back and we, we engaged in a conversation and, and the person was in the post. I don't remember the exact, the exact topic of the post, but because of this post, the person was talking about what they had done for a design exercise that they engaged in for a job posting. I do remember that much. And the person was, I'm starting to remember now, the person was asking for opinions and share what they had presented in this design exercise that they did for the job post. And I made a couple of statements about what they had posted, and, and I won't get into that part of it. Uh, it's not really relevant for what we're trying to show here. And it really has nothing to do with, with the design exercise. The problem is, uh, again, I'm addressing corrupt hiring practices this person told me, he thanked me for what I said, but he also said there were 50 people who were working and delivered a, a solution in a design exercise for this particular company. The company harvested 50 different design ideas from all of these applicants, and, I, and he found out and relayed the information to me, nobody got hired. Now, does that mean that there was that nobody was qualified? No, it doesn't. It's possible that somebody was qualified, but they didn't care. There are companies that will do this to get free work out of unsuspecting job applicants and then go and monetize, implement the things that people present in the design exercises. This is a very sinister thing that companies are engaging in today. I know people who won't even do design exercises today for that reason. You don't really know when it's going to be legit sometimes. It depends on the structure. I've had people do research exercises before. When I was a hiring manager, I had people do research exercises, but the way that everything was structured, they knew. Number one, they knew that we weren't going to put too much weight. I, I just wanted to know how the person thought but we didn't give them anything that we were going to turn around and implement. We didn't give them a real thing. They knew that everything was fictitious. They knew that I conveyed that to them. I wanted to make sure they were as comfortable as possible. Cause a lot of design exercises are very unethical in general, the way that people put them together, design exercises, uh, personality trait, uh, tests, things like that. This kind of thing is silly uh, and people shouldn't be doing that. And a lot, a lot of people are doing that. That goes for portfolios too. Portfolios are the kiss of death when people ask for them. And a lot of times when people do this, it's because they don't know how to evaluate talent. So they they sort of default to whatever the status quo is and they don't care that they're not going to get the right person. They, they're they afraid and they don't want to admit that they don't know how to evaluate talent. So they just lean on these weak and barely approaches. So at any rate, a lot of corrupt hiring practices out there. Beware of it. Um, try to identify it. Try to understand what's going to happen when it comes to design exercises. I know companies that now they will pay applicants for their time. It makes it less uh, painful <laughs> and less unethical, but it can still be unethical even if they're paying you. So just something to be aware of out there. And last one, number eight for this particular segment. It's really sad that People like me, I know a lot of people like me, my my students, 
in in the I, I I teach in master's programs. I teach in UX certification programs or certificate programs, I should say. And people invest time to learn about the discipline. People invest their time and their money, their their goodwill to learn about the discipline of UX. They want to get better at it. They want to be good at it. They want to be qualified. It's really sad. This is another hiring rant that people work to optimize their expertise, their acumen, only to be passed over for posers, retrofits, and upstarts. And it's sad because a lot of times you work to be your best and people will reject you because you are your best. Isn't that weird? But it's happening. In droves. Again, this is not just me. Some people like to they like to say that this is just me so they can minimize it and ignore what I'm saying. And I've had people ignore what I'm saying, try to trivialize what I'm saying, go out, get bitten in the rear by what I'm saying, and guess who they come back to to cry the blues? And and I, I can only laugh <laughs> because like, what do you want me to do? You, you I, I warned you, I told you. Where do you think I was talking from? You think I just, I'm just making stuff up? You think that I talk to hear myself? I'm trying to help the community. I'm thankful that there are some people out here do, who do appreciate. There's a lot of people who don't. But it's really sad when, when I see people, and I've seen hundreds of students over my time. I've met hundreds of students that go to other institutions I don't teach at. People who are investing and trying to make themselves better only to be rejected for and overlooked for the same reasons. So I'm hoping that the, I hope there's somebody under the sound of my voice who has the authority to make sure that their team doesn't do this. Make sure that you hire actual qualified people. When you have a boss who knows that they shouldn't be in their position, they're not usually going to do it because they don't want to hire people that are better than them. They don't want to hire people that are definitely smarter than them. They don't want to hire anybody who's more experienced and more skilled and more astute than them. So that's why a lot of times these companies are opting for the person who knows nothing so they can control them. Because when somebody gives you something you don't deserve, you're more likely to do whatever they say and not rock the boat. People who know something are going to rock the boat if the boat needs to be rocked. We don't rock the boat for the sake of rocking the boat. We rock the boat because the boat needs to be rocked. We understand that. So, because we've been trained to spot it. So, it's really sad. I want to encourage everybody out there. You are working to be your best. You are studying. You're getting books. You're going to workshops. You're going to school. You're studying different things. So, you can be the best UX professional that you can be. Don't allow the malpractice and the unethical behaviors of some change your perspective. Don't allow them to change who you are. I can't encourage you enough today because it does. It tempts you. I, I had a conversation with somebody just today when I was talking about what's going on in UX. They said, you thought about doing something else? This sounds crazy. Yeah, it does sound crazy. But when you're invested, what, what else are you supposed to do? You can't go somewhere else because then people are going to say you're overqualified and then they're just going to blow you off. And we have reached the day where doing real UX work can actually get you in trouble because there's so many people and so many institutions, so many companies that don't know what UX is to the extent they can't value it when they see it. I, I have on multiple occasions during my career made 25, 50 changes in a design only for people to come back and say that I did nothing. They had no idea. And it wasn't until I could go back and walk them through what was done that they realized it and their jaw just dropped. And they learned how to look at things the way that UX people do. We're very granular by trade. We're very micro experience oriented by trade. So we're looking at things out of a completely different lens or through a completely different lens than the average stakeholder, the, av the average client. We see things from a completely different perspective. So it's really interesting when all these things happen, but this is what we're dealing with today. So, you know, I let that person know I'm going to continue to go forward until it's time for me to bow out. I can't do anything else. Where, where am I going to go? What else am I going to do? So somebody, there's somebody out there that will appreciate you. There's somebody out there that will value you. There's somebody else out there that will love to have an actual qualified person 
on their team. What a novel idea. Because it's certainly not what's happening in a lot of a lot of circles today. I know that these things, that's all that we have for today. I know these things can sound discouraging. We're just letting you know that the road is out, the bridge is out, there's potholes ahead, there's a dead end. You need to know whenever there are obstacles, when you're trying to make a journey and there are obstacles on that journey, you need to know what the obstacles are and that way you can navigate yourself to a point of success and you can go from point A to point B without experiencing detrimental circumstances. So let's keep that in mind. Keep your head up. I mean, my head is up. <laughs> and people say different things. They might try to tell you my head's not up. My head's up. You got If your head's not up, you won't be able to see the thing that's up ahead. So keep your head up at all time and, and just make sure to keep going forward. And when that opportunity comes, you'll be prepared for it. When that opportunity comes, if you keep growing yourself in the discipline, when that opportunity comes, you'll be able to execute within that role. And when people don't understand UX, help them to understand UX when they want to know. When people see what you did, be ready. Be in a position to explain what you did and why. But do not, under any circumstances, become these sinister people today. That's the temptation that we're dealing with today because a lot of people are kowtowing. A lot of people, they know we're not supposed to be order takers, but they'd rather become an order taker so they can, they know they got to pay the bills, so they compromise. That's not supposed to be an area of compromise. When you compromise to that degree, you violate the ethics of the discipline. What you say? You didn't know that UX had ethics? Yeah, it does. But we'll talk about that another time. Folks, that's it for today. Hope you got a lot out of this. Keep your head up. Keep your head up. And until next time, this is Darren Hood, the host of The World of UX, signing off. Happy UXing, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this session of CX of M Radio. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit cxofm.org for more resources.